I told you, Lee, I'm going to grow that down to my down to my knees. One of those old prophets. I'm not. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yeah, oh, Brother Paul there, he cut his. Trimmed it down about a week later, it's back the same length again. His safety issue is getting it stuck in his green beans or something when he was trying to eat, so... He's done with all that. Anyway, but uh, you pray for Brother Russ and, and Candy. Uh, Sister Candy's back is not feeling well. And uh, we had that long trip that we went on to Atlanta. And uh, she uh, it really strained her neck and back quite a bit. Long drive, of course. So um, just pray for her that that would get better. And she just has to take a little bit of a break from the drive and everything. They're... Praying about the Lord, allowing them to move closer, you know, and everything too, so that'll be easier. But, but uh, we should see them back here next week. Uh, so just uh, pray for them at this time. Um, also, this I I've been thinking about this, and and uh, I think this Wednesday, I think I'm going to move the service to Thursday actually. Uh, and there's a there's a, a there's a event coming up on Wednesday. That I think we need to be at to preach at uh, downtown Minneapolis um, to preach outside of. There's going to be about oh, I'd say probably. I, I, I'm guessing. Does anybody know what what size crowd, brother Aaron? Do you know what size crowd that that concert's going to bring down there? It's sold out. So you're you're probably looking at I don't know thirty forty thousand people down there downtown. We're gonna we're gonna go take our scripture signs and we're gonna go down there and preach and hand out gospel tracts down there. They're having an Alice Cooper concert down there, and a Motley Crue concert, and we're gonna preach outside of that concert there. Uh, last time we preached in downtown Minneapolis was for the uh, the Kenny Chesney concert, the 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 country concert that they had down there, and. Uh, that was full of a bunch of drunks and and uh, and fornicators, and as the music is, that's what that's what it teaches anyway. But that's where it was. Yeah, good old boys. Yeah, and uh, they weren't very good though. <laughs> Not very good, but uh, pretty bad old boys. But uh, anyway, went down there and we preached and handed out a lot of gospel tracts and warned men to repent and and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there were thousands of people. There was probably forty thousand people down there. Uh, there was 49,000 people down there, to be exact, that came flooding out of that concert, and we gave them, and they got a witness, they got preaching, they got a witness down there, and they got a lot of tracks handed out, <laughs> and, um, you know, we're going to, what's that? Amen, that's right. So we're going to go there Wednesday, and I believe we're going to do the same thing there Wednesday. Uh, what we'll do on Wednesday is we'll go there before the concert, and we'll hand out a bunch of tracts while all the people are flooding into there and preach while people are flooding in there, okay? And then we'll go eat some eat some dinner somewhere um, and then come back and we'll preach as they're coming out, okay? And uh, because there'll be, a, there'll be a stream of thousands of people that'll be flooding out of that place and we want to be there. So it'll be a late night, uh, but we need to go there and preach, amen? We need to warn those people. Somebody needs to tell them. You know, somebody needs to tell them they need to be saved. And um, so, and they need to preach the gospel to them. So that's what we're going to do. That'll be downtown Minneapolis. Uh, and, and that's where we'll actually be. And uh, look forward to that. Hello. Nope, you're up the, you got to go up, up the hall there. Yep. But, uh. No, we're the. <laughs> I... What? No. Oh, was it? Nice. <laughs> you should have went and talked to him. <laughs> you don't know him, brother Lee, and I know him. Anyway, um, so we're gonna do that now. Remember today. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have this service. We're gonna have another one. I'll, I'll preach a couple messages to you. Then we're gonna have lunch, 
and then we're going to take off and help uh, uh, Brother Nate uh, unload his, uh, his, his truck there and get all moved into his apartment, all right, afterwards. So uh, that's what we'll be doing today, but uh, we'll have some pizza here, and it, it'll, it'll be, I don't know, around, uh, Dad will go get it about quarter to one and pick it up and then um, bring it back, and we'll have it around that time, so. Nope, sorry, I don't have any of that. I didn't bring any of that. But uh, anyway, so uh, <laughs> that'll be, that'll definitely be, yeah, Casey's, yep, over by Roy's house. So anyway, but um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to that, amen, uh, and then spend the time together and then keeping it simple here today. That's why we didn't bring all the, all the crock pots and everything else like that, just because I want it to be easy to be able to do the work that we have to get done here today. And everything. All right, I want you to open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 1. And I, I am fairly confident you've probably never heard a sermon on this. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I could be wrong, but uh, I'm probably right about this one. Uh, but I hope you have, but maybe you haven't. But I'll tell you, it's been in the news a lot lately, and this, this topic has. And... I really believe that as Christians, as, the, as a local church, we've got to really, uh, we have to really let no, people know where we stand and where we believe the, what, the, what the Bible says about something. And we need to make that known, and we ought not be ashamed of what we believe. And we ought to be very clear about what we believe so people understand and they know the truth of the Scriptures, what the Bible says, uh, God's Holy Word says about a subject. There's been a lot of talk about abortion lately. And it's been a big talk about it. You say, I've heard a lot of sermons about abortion. I'm sure you have, okay? I, I'm sure you have. Um, but I'm not sure you've heard a lot of, a lot of uh, sermons on birth control, though. Birth control and the Bible. And are we really against abortion? These are Bible. Th see, this is a Bible topic. This is a, this is a Bible issue. And the churches have skirted this issue for a very long time. In fact, they have changed their position. Um, and if not openly, then, then by default, by not saying anything, they've changed their position over time. And I believe they've made it comfortable for abortion to be, to be okay in America. They've made it comfortable for promiscuity to be okay in America. Because past, that's right, because past, they're, they're ashamed to talk, but they won't talk about it. And it's a shame. It's brought shame to the church. But much shame to it because they won't define these issues according to the scriptures. But we've allowed you would be surprised, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pray and get right into this. Father, I need you, Lord. I pray you'd bless us. Lord God, help us understand this great truth from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm gonna read you Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Well, that takes care of worrying about some stupid lion out in the middle of Africa that's eating people anyway. All right, that'll, that'll nail that down real quick. All right, we'll just get, get that, uh, that issue out of the way real quick right there. You say, are you for hunting down animals and killing for no reason? Well, not really, but I don't know if you know what lions are like in the middle of Africa, but they're not exactly friendly. I don't know if you realize that. They, they do eat people. I mean, they'll eat you if they get a chance. That's right. And those people eat them. And that animal was killed and somebody ate it. Somebody ate it. Amen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And we see this uproar, this uprising over this lion, but nobody wants to talk about Planned Parenthood. Nobody wants to talk about what they've had, the bunch of devil-possessed butchers. And your president, who you could just call Nimrod, because that's exactly who he is, he wants to be the world leader. He wants to be that antichrist. He wants to be that man that rules the world. That's what his desire is. You can see it. Why else would you go over to Africa and say, listen, you got to start accepting homosexuality? Why would you go force that on other people like that? Oh, you got to start accepting this. Well, we're not going to give you any money if you don't accept this. Right. 
And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. But I'm just curious, does anybody think God changed his mind about that? Yeah, I haven't heard God change his mind about that. Have you? No. And replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Then in Genesis chapter 9, if we move forward to there, we, some people say, well, that was before the flood. Okay, well, let's go after the flood then. Genesis chapter 9. A new go- uh, and an actual civil government, I believe, is set up in Genesis chapter 9. I believe you can see that, that God gave them and said, hey, listen, if a man kill another man, so shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So God set up a government and said, now you're responsible. If someone kills somebody, you're responsible in cold-blooded murder. You're responsible to take their life. Because they murdered somebody. Because they killed somebody you know, in, in cold blood. Right? So God sets up civil government there. He sets up man with the responsibility. It's your responsibility now to do this. He set up Noah to do that. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's right. He said be fruitful and multiply and now replenish the earth. So... Where did this philosophy come into independent Baptist churches or just fundamental churches across the board in America today? Where did this philosophy come from that birth control was was okay, that birth control was supposed to be used? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you a short history of birth control and where it came from. I think you're going to be shocked that most pastors you know take their theology about birth control, take their theology about uh, um, raising children or having children, they take it from Margaret Sanger. I bet you'd be shocked to know that most pastors get their, get their understanding for that from Margaret Sanger. They have the same ideology that Margaret Sanger had. And they push the same thing. And I'm going to read it to you. And I, you know how I like to do I like to use their own words against them. So I'm going to use their own words. Don't worry, we'll get back into the scriptures, but I'm going to use their own words again to give you a short history of understanding. Then we're going to go to the Bible and see where birth control was used in the Bible, and somebody died. All right, we're going to show you that too. All right, the history of birth control. Now, we're just going to give you some, some, some history from, from the past and everything, and then we'll get back into this. But in ancient China, concubines are thought to have used a drink of lead and mercury in order to prevent pregnancy. You know, the possible side effects of that were, st- were becoming sterile, brain damage, kidney failure, and death. Well, I mean, you'll find that the birth control pill causes most of those things, too. You'll find that. We'll get to that. In ancient Egypt, and by the way, when I mean birth, I don't mean just a pill. It's all of it all, all around the board. You don't see anywhere where God said, you prevent, you withhold life. You keep back life. You're a God, and you can choose who has life. You can choose whether I bless you or not with that. God never gave you the right to do that. God never gave you the authority to do that. Not at all. We've taken apart. Well, you know, I have all these. Okay, give me all your reasons. I'm going to get to those reasons. Give me all your reasons. And we're going to see if those reasons line up with the Bible. We're going to see what God says about your reasons. Okay? We'll, we'll look at it. Let's see. In ancient Egypt, for example, around 1500 BC, women would mix honey, sodium, car- sodium carbonate, and crocodile dung. And they make a, a, a thick, solid paste with that. I'm not going to go any deeper into that, but that's what they would do. All right? I'll let you figure out the rest. You don't need to. You can look it up yourself if you want to. All right. In 200, they also recommended that women hold their breath during, uh, during the marriage bed, followed by sneezing afterwards to prevent, to prevent pregnancy. That didn't work. <laughs> didn't, didn't, wasn't really, didn't work. It didn't work. You hold your breath too long, you're not going to breathe anymore. If that's the only way it works, then you're in trouble, okay? That doesn't work, all right? Doesn't, just thought I'd let you know that in case you didn't. But, I mean, there's other, other various ways they did poisons. It is said in some books, in some secular books, that some would admit and say that fallen angels or devils taught them how to, early on, before the flood, how to withhold, how, how to make somebody uh, not have babies, how to use birth control. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard, it, I've heard it written before that some have said that, and I believe that this is a devilish design. So you would, it wouldn't be too far of a stretch for me to believe that somebody or that devils were involved or demons were involved with this or fallen angels were involved with this or Satan was involved with this industry, right? I mean, that's not hard to, 
we understand that Satan wants to do the opposite of what God wants. Always. So if God says be fruitful and multiply, he says, hey, don't have any kids. And then he gives you all these reasons. And then he whispers in your ear, yea, hath God said? And then you start to listen to him. You say, yeah, you're right, you know? The 20th century would eventually see the most advanced and revolutionary development of birth control in history. But at the start of the century, the phrase birth control, listen, wasn't part of the common parlance. You, if you spoke about birth control like that openly, people would look at you and be like, what are you, a devil or something? Do you see how we have fed into evolution? We have fed into it. This whole birth control issue, it is fed in by evolution. It is driven by evolution. That is its design. We, the churches have evolved to accept these things. They've had to accept evolutionary principles to accept birth control. You have to. You have to accept them. Margaret Sanger, here we go, a determined nurse and activist who would revolutionize reproductive rights in America, first coined the phrase in 1914 with the launch of a monthly newsletter called The Woman Rebel. Isn't that sweet? So now you have pastors that tell people, and by the way, I've been a part of this, and I, I did this too because I thought this was the way it was supposed to be. I had to repent of this. Because when I first learned, everybody was like, well, listen, you know, you shouldn't have kids right away, Brother Paul. You should just wait a few years. Get to know each other first and wait a few years and see what the Lord does down the road and everything else like that. So go ahead and withhold that and keep that. Okay, where do you find that in the Bible anywhere? You don't. You don't find it anywhere. Where did it come from? Margaret Sanger. That's where it came from. It's a eugenic principle. That's what it is. <laughs> and we fell for it. Well, it's going to be a long one. I got to get moving. All right. She first, how do you like that title? The woman rebel. Do you like that? The woman, yeah, it means witch. That's pretty much what it means. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's right. The, the woman rebel. The newsletter offered information about birth control and was a flagrant challenge to the country's obscenity laws. Yeah, we actually had some obscenity laws. You couldn't walk around naked. You, know, you couldn't talk wicked. You couldn't talk dirty to people. You couldn't walk around and you know, be a sick, perverted pig. You, know? you couldn't be a... So they actually had some obscenity laws against them. You couldn't like mail pornography to people all over the country. Yeah, you weren't allowed to do that. Like, oh, like you couldn't Europe. Oh, don't we just want to be like Europe? What do you want to be like that godless mess for? But that's what they that, that's what they had some city laws against things. And she, by the way, it wasn't long before Sanger was indicted for breaching the obscenity laws and fled the country to avoid trial. See, she had very rich and wealthy people that backed her. Very rich and wealthy people. Connected to high high level Luciferians and all kinds of things. I mean, they would, she had she had connections. I mean, Crowley connects. I mean, they had she had, they had all the different people. Uh, uh, what was that guy's um was it Loveless? Well, I, Nate, I can't remember that guy. Anyway, go back and listen to that. You remember that guy that was her go-to between guy, and he was an occultist too, a big time? I can't remember, but if you go back and listen to the sermon I did on Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, a witch's rebellion against God, go listen to that, that sermon online, and, you'll, and I have all that information there. I can't remember the name right now of that man. What, Lovelock, thank you, Lovelock, that was his name. What's that? Havelock, that's it, Havelock, yeah. He was, a, he was an occultist too as well. And, uh, I mean, so she had a lot of connections to a lot of wicked people, a lot of influential people that had a lot of money. But Margaret Sanger is one of the main reasons why Baptist pastors and fundamentalist pastors accept and promote when they're in their counseling birth control. She's why. They don't even know it, probably, a lot of them. I don't think any of them know it. You wouldn't know it unless you studied it out, figure out. You know, you have to take a look. There's some time in your ministry you have to sit back, and I did this about four years ago. And I said, you know what? Why do we do this stuff? Why do we do any of this stuff? And I started looking at stuff like, why are we doing this? And I started to come to the realization that there was no biblical reason for some of the things that we were doing. So then if there's no biblical reason for it, where does it come from and should we continue it? And then I found out where it came from. Many different issues. All right. Let's see. All right, so by 1916, Sanger was back and opening the first family planning clinic in the U.S. 
Now, that's a, that family planning is a neat way to say either abortion or birth control or I hate babies. Right, and I hate God. That's right. Absolutely. That's what it is. All right. It was shut down within a week and a half. Five years on, Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which would later become the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. In 1950, while in her 80s, Sanger, now listen to this, where'd the pill come from? Like, like how'd that get about? Oh, that's an interesting story. We're going to tell that story here a little bit so you understand where it came from. And I want this to go to as many people as, as can hear. I pray the Lord send this everywhere so you can understand the truth of this. Then when you start reading the satanic design behind all this, then you'll actually trust God and see children as a blessing and not a curse. Because it's satanic. When you look at children like that, when you look at them like there's some kind of a financial obligation, that is a satanic principle. Everybody hear me okay? In 1950, while in her 80s, Sanger underwrote the research necessary to create the first human birth control pill. She raised $150,000 for the project. That's where it came from. There's more players in this, and I'll get to them. Writing in the New York Review of Books last year, Carl, uh, a man named Carl declared that within the invention of the birth control pill, listen to this, they use a different term, I'll use fornication, became, uh, became separated from its reproductive consequences. Do you understand what the whole thing? Listen, this was the rise of the sexual revolution, okay? So what they did is they swept in the pill. They swept in contraceptives. Why? To push the sexual revolution on America and on the world. To push it, but to push it with no consequences then. Now you don't have to have children. Now you can keep it and you can have all your wicked fornication and you can fill the land with perverts. That's what they did. Right. No visible consequence for it. Yeah, except all the diseases. They didn't count. They didn't think about that, did they? See, they forgot about God and all this is what they did. They thought they could mock God is what they thought. It changed. He said the, the pill was one of the great, was, was the biggest game changer basically in the world. And I think he's right. As I've looked at it, I believe he's right. I can't deny what he's saying. I believe the man is right. I believe it was, and here's why. The, pioneer, uh, the, the reason why is because it changed the dynamic of everything. There was no longer any shame to anything. There was no longer any, uh, you wouldn't have illegitimate children as much. You wouldn't have all this, and it would give people a freer time to do whatever they wanted to do. And there's other reasons we'll get to. He says here, it changed the realities of human reproduction. The pioneering chemist who died on January 30th of complications from liver and bone cancer at age of 91 was dubbed the father of the birth control pill after he created the key ingredient used in oral contraceptives. The importance of his discovery and the dog and the, do, the dog research of numerous other scientists can't be understated. Today, a staggering 99% of American women of childbearing age report using some form of contraceptive one time or another. 90 Nine percent. In 1937, headway in Sanger's fight was made when the American Medical Association officially recognized birth control as a legitimate part of a doctor's practice. See, did you understand before it was outlawed? Yeah, it was outlawed. Like, it was illegal to have birth control. It was absolutely illegal to sell it or anything else like that. But see, the devil knows how to do something. He just slips it in little by little. Slips it in. He's subtle. He slips everything in. All right. A year later, a judge lifted the federal obscenity ban on birth control. The laws against contraceptive, contraception remained on the books in most states. America went from 55 birth control clinics in 1930 to more than 800 in 1942. By the 1950s, Sanger landed on a better way to serve that demand. She approached biologist Gregory Pincus, who had something of a reputation as a Dr. Frankenstein-like character. Listen. <laughs> Due to his experiments with in vitro fertilization of rabbits and asked him to conduct research on the use of hormones for contraception. 
which is the absolute most dangerous thing. One of the most dangerous things that's ever been put on women. That right there. It has literally changed everything. Unbeknownst to Sanger and Pincus, a scientist in Mexico City had already had success creating a progesterone pill synthesized from wild yams, which could block ovulation. That scientist was Carl DeGeracy, then just a, a 20-something, but already the associate director of a research at the pharmaceutical company Syntex. You know some of the most wicked people in the world are pharmaceutical companies? They got the most devils, and they produce the most wicked chemicals on man. And, and, and put them on man and use man as a bunch of test dummies. Then came the landmark date marking the biggest change to America's contraceptive potential in history. On May 9, 1960, the FDA approved en Enovid, an oral contraceptive pill released by G.D. Cyril and Company. By 1965, almost 6.5 million American women were on the pill. The oral contraceptive enduring vague nickname which is thought to have stemmed from women requesting it from their doctors as discreetly as possible. That same year, the Supreme Court struck down state laws that prohibited contraception use. See, the states wanted to say, no, you can't do that still. They, they, no, sorry. Supreme Court comes in. No, we can't have that. Though only for married couples. Unmarried people were still out of luck until 1972 when birth control was deemed legal for all. See, but what people don't realize, and I'll get to again, what people don't realize, when they brought out this pill, they didn't bring it out for birth control. They brought it out for another use. And then they popularized it. You know what they put boldly on the, on the package? May prevent pregnancies. Because they knew it prevented pregnancies, and they were giving it to women for a menstrual cycle to help with a menstrual cycle, but they were really introducing it for birth control. That was the whole purpose of doing it. That's why they did it. But they put that on there so then people could take it so any woman could walk into a doctor at that time and any woman could say, yeah, I'm having trouble with this. Oh, well, here you go. Because they knew what it did and that's how they, that's how they got it out. That's, you see, that beast, the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. Even by 1966, the pill's effect were apparent. That year, Time Magazine wrote, no previous medical phenomenon has ever quite matched the headlong U U.S. rush to use the oral contraceptives, now universally known as the pills. Indeed, by the time 1973 rolled around, a whopping 70% of married women between the ages of 15 and 44 were using some form of contraception. Why? Because America stopped believing God. And it was available, and it was easy to get. And they didn't believe God anymore. That's right. They did. Absolutely. The pill was an international revolution as well. In 1967, Time reported that despite the pill's necessar necessarily strict routine, uneducated women could still manage. The latest report showed that illiterate women who can't count can still take their pills on schedule. I don't know if you understand what they're saying, but basically they were feeding these pills to people that didn't really understand what they were taking so they could make them sterile. Do you get it? Don't believe me? I've already covered it in Planned Parenthood sermon. Go back and listen to it. The United States government and doctors sterilized different people around the country. They would go in, and women would go into clinics, and they would forcibly sterilize them so they could not have children. That's what they did, and they did it to black people because they were a bunch of racist devils is what they were. And they hated black people. They hate because they followed evolution. This is a response of evolution. The, the survival of the fittest. What's that called, Nate, on the title of that uh, of Darwin's book? Yeah, the preservation of favored races. That's what is right on Darwin's first copy of his book, his first edition. Preservation of favored races. Now you think about that. And Sanger was an avid follower of all of that. Eugenics and everything else. I'm telling you, folks, the, the church, you know, the church is always 20 years behind the world when it comes, if they're not if they're not following the Lord, they are 20 years behind. And what were they? They 20 years later, you have Christians, you have evangelicals, you have all these people that are saying, hey, it's okay to use birth control. It's okay. Why? When did God ever tell you it was okay to do that? 
When did God ever tell you it was okay to do that? I didn't ask you what somebody else told you was okay, what the United States government said or anybody else. When did God ever say in his word it was okay for you to do that? In Pakistan, Denver's Dr. John Cobb got dozens of them to do it simply by starting them on a night of new moon. In Taiwan, where IUDs have won wide, except as more and more women are switching to the pills, the number of users outside the U.S. is about 5 million, the figure is rising. Not that the pill was without critics. In fact, the fact that its rise coincided with second wave feminism and the sexual revolution. Listen, this goes back even deeper, and Nate and I are going to do this on the radio sometime. We're going to cover Kinsey, okay? Kinsey is the one that, that, porn, uh, that, that caused the pornification of America, okay? That all factored in. If you don't know who Alfred Kinsey is, my goodness. Go, uh, Chris Pinto, I don't recommend every, everything Chris Pinto says or does, but I'm going to tell you what. This video that he did on, on, the, on Kinsey, what's it called, the Kinsey Report or something like that? The Kinsey Syndrome. You, it, it, you adults, don't let your children watch this, but adults, you watch this and you listen to this, uh, and you will find that all of that was leading up to the cause this 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 uh, sexual revolution, and he fed into it, and this pill enabled it. It just put it just it made it easier, made it a lot easier. That that second wave of feminism and the sexual revolution meant that many people pointed to the contraceptive as the trigger that changed society. They said it. Many researchers have pointed out the cultural views on sexuality and women's roles were shifting well before the pill was introduced. Some African-American leaders were especially, now listen, were especially critical of the pill, claiming that it was being peddled in their community for the purpose of black genocide. I agree. They were right. That's exactly what it was for. But nothing stopped the pill from catching on. Today, more than 100 million women around the world use the pill in order to prevent pregnancy. We are a nation that is living absolutely defiant with God. And I'll, I'll go one step further. We are churches in this nation that are absolutely living defiant to God. Absolutely. Now, why would anyone believe that black genocide was the goal or genocide was the goal or the preservation of favored races? Why would it, well, let me read you some quotes from Margaret Sanger, the one that underwrited the pill, and we'll see what she says, okay? On the extermination of blacks, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, she said. If it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members, woman's body, woman's right, a social history of birth control in America by Linda Gordon. Margaret Sanger said this on the purpose of birth control. The purpose in promoting birth control was to create a race of thoroughbreds. Margaret Sanger on blacks, immigrants, and indigents, human weeds, Reckless breeders, spawning human beings who never should have been born. Margaret Sanger, pivot of civilization, referring to immigrants and poor people. Yeah, exactly. While Planned Parenthood's current apologists try to place some distance between the eugenics and birth control movements, history definitely, definitively says otherwise. The eugenic theme figured prominently in the birth control review, which Sanger founded in 1917. She published such articles as some moral aspects of eugenics. I, I think pastors should put their name on that today. That, that counseled young people to do that. Right? They should do the same thing. The eugenic conscience, February 1921. The purpose of eugenics, December 1924. Birth control and positive eugenics, July 1925. Birth control, the true eugenics, August 1928. I wonder why they thought, Brother Nate, I wonder why they, I wonder why black leaders were concerned that this might be used for black genocide. The eugenic and civilization value of birth control is becoming apparent to the enlightened and intelligent. The campaign for birth control is not merely of eugenic value, but it practically, it practically identical and ideal with the final aim of eugenics. Margaret Sanger, 1921. So let me ask you, Christian. When did we as Christians take on the ideology of Margaret Sanger? 
When did we accept the ideology of market say? See, all you have to do is put a distance of a few years between, between people like this and just produce the teaching and change the name of who the teacher is and just keep producing that ideology and say it over and over and over again. And what happens? People are just going to follow suit with it and they're going to accept it. And now today to say a lady is no big deal. Now it's no big deal. Margaret Sanger also said the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Yeah. Margaret Sanger, Woman in the New Race, Eugenics, publication, 1920, 1923. Not to be undone by her followers, Margaret Sanger spoke of sterilizing those she designated as unfit, a plan she said would be the salvation of American civilization. And she also, she also spoke of those who were irresponsible and reckless among whom she included those whose religious scruples prevent their exercising control over their numbers. She means us. She, she's talking about us. That's what she means by that. Christians that have babies that, don't believe, that, that believe the Bible and say it when the Bible says be fruitful and multiply, they actually believe God. That's who she's talking about. See, Margaret Sanger grew up in a, a large family and they were poor and, and a lot of the babies, and, and, and they didn't have a lot. So she... She hated, she hated God because of it, basically. And she hated children because of it. She was the worst mother you could ever imagine. She left her son off somewhere and left him and took off and, and started the sexual revolution and ran around and was a fornicating whore is what she was. Wicked, devil-possessed woman. It's not very nice, I know. It's not very nice to be a whore and run around and leave your children like that. And to want to sterilize people because you hate babies, you wicked devil. <clears throat> she further contended that there is no doubt in the minds of all thinking people that the procreation of this group should be stopped. What is she talking about? You! See, I don't know why people don't understand that this is all a war against God and His people. That's what all this is about. But see, they don't have anything to get excited about. So people are like, why do you yell and why do you that? Because i got something to be excited about. <laughs> That's why. That's why. Dr. Harry Laughlin, another Sanger associate and board member for her group, spoke of purifying Americans America's human breeding stock, and purging America's bad strains. These strains include the shiftless, ignorant, and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South. Wait a minute, what was that about? Well, you know what that's about, don't you? See, there was a revival that took place down South. There was a man named George Whitfield that preached a great awakening. There was another man named Shubal Stearns that got saved in that meeting. And then he went on and he got baptized. And then guess what he did? Then he started a church and he was ordained and started a church. And then guess what happened? A thousand churches started out of that. And that, and that flew, the whole South was, was full of churches that were Bible-believing churches. So what did the devil do? The devil sent a civil war to America to destroy the revival in America and to burn out anything that had to do with it. And they destroyed the South and decimated the South. Why? Because that's where the people were that were saved and on fire for God. So he destroyed the South. And then they still have, and the Pope, by the way, <laughs> still hates the South. Still hates it. Still wants to destroy the South. Why do you think all this rebel flag? Listen, you ought to be more worried about the Planned Parenthood flag than the rebel flag. All right? Than the Confederate flag. I don't fly any flag, okay? I don't believe in any flags. All right, I just don't. I got this. This is all I need right here. That's my flag right there. I don't need any flags. I don't, I don't believe in that Protestant flag they call Christian flag. I don't fly that thing either. Because under that banner, a lot of my brethren were murdered or my brethren were persecuted. So I, I don't fly that flag either. I don't need to fly a Baptist flag. I, don't need to fly, I got a Bible. That's all the flag I need. I don't need any other flag. I don't need anything else. That's it right there. That's the flag I have. That's right. Amen. That's right. But you better be more worried about Planned Parenthood's flag because more black people have died from Planned Parenthood than from that Confederate flag any day. You know, if black people were really appalled by what's going on, 
They'd be with me standing outside of Planned Parenthood whenever they could in droves preaching against black genocide and what those people have done and calling those people to repentance. But see, they've been duped too. They've been fooled and they've been duped, just like most American has, to go worry about a flag from the South. By the way, more tyranny is, 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 is done today under the United States flag than any flag. Than any flag. All right, back to this. Yeah, distress. I cannot refrain from saying that women must come to recognize there is some function of womanhood other than being a childbearing machine. What Every Girl Should Know by Margaret Sanger. You see, the history of birth control in America is absolutely connected with genocide, abortion, and every other wicked atrocity against God. The goal of the pill was free love. You can fornicate like a bunch of dogs now with no consequences because, hey, nobody will know. Again, look at this quote. Not that the pill was without critics. The fact is that the rise coincided with the second wave of feminism. What is it? It's feminism. You see, Satan had it. Satan had it right at the right time with that witch Margaret Sanger, that she would teach that revolution. And it was fine. And it was time to come out of the roles. And what better time to do it, the sexual revolution with the pill, that women would come out of their roles of being um, you know, submissive to their husbands and being a, a mother that took care of their children, and come out and, and, and be a man. Come out and just act like a man. That's right. But most of the time, the church is only 20 years behind the world. Remember, remembering our history, listen to this, the history, though deeply troubled, seemed to be forgotten. The moment the pill was marketed to women living in the continental U.S., ads for the pill promoted the product by touting women's liberation. Do you understand that? Now, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't do that for Christian women. They don't tout that now, do they? No. But that's how they got their audience. It was for, it was for liberation. Already a hot topic of the discussion in the early 1960s, and which largely enabled the sexual revolution of that decade, as Nancy Cohen has pointed out in Alternet. The pill remains statistically the most popular form of birth control for women to date. Within five years of the pill's legalization, six million American women were on it. By 2012, that number jumped to 10.6 million. I think that date's wrong. It's more than that now, but anyway. That was from uh, the dark history of birth control. In, 19, in the 1950s, Four people were the founders of the birth control movement. A controversial scientist, a Catholic obstetrician, and a wealthy feminist got together to create a revolutionary little pill that would never, would have never been seen before. They were sneaky about it, what they were doing, skirting the law, lying to women. Listen, lying to women about the tests they performed and lying to the public about their motivations. They absolutely could have been in prison for some of the work they were doing. Journalist Jonathan Egg tells Fresh Air's Terry Gross, these guys are like guerrilla warriors. They're always having to figure out ways to do this thing that will attract the least attention. They could never really say they're testing birth control because it was illegal. But if you do it under research, you can get away with anything in America. And they have. Eeg tells the history in, in his new book, The Birth of the Pill, how four crusaders reinnovated and launched a revolution. The four people who created this revolution were Margaret Sanger, who believed that women could not should be able to enjoy that freedom until they, were, until they could control when and whether they got pregnant. They could never enjoy themselves. They could never fornicate freely until they knew they wouldn't get pregnant. Right. And another man named Gregory Pincus, who was who was fired from Harvard for experimenting with in vitro fertilization and bragging about it to the mainstream press. John Rock was the, was the Catholic OBGYN and worked with Pincus to conduct tests of the pill on women. And Catherine McCormick, who funded much of the research, she was the wealthy liberation. She was the wealthy feminist. In the 1950s, Selling contraception was still officially illegal in many states, but Sanger and McCormick, a feminist who had been active in the suffrage movement and wanted women to enjoy that life without fear of getting pregnant. After McCormick's husband died, McCormick got in touch with Sanger. According to Egg, 
McCormick said this, what's the most important thing we could possibly work on? Sanger said, the best thing we could possibly do is work on this pill, this miracle tablet, something that would give women the right to control their bodies for the first time. And McCormick said, I'm in, whatever you need. A couple of years went by, and, was, and I was still thinking about it. His case was that it had changed more than just science. This man, said, this, uh, this man said, you know what, this pill changed everything in society. So this other man says in a Time magazine or another report on alternate news, there's a, there's a couple different sources I have for this. He said the pill changed the human dynamics. It had changed the way men and women get along in the world. Yeah, they see each other as purely sexual objects now. That's how they get along. And that's what it's all about now. There's no foundation of family. There's none of that. It's all about fulfilling your desires. Lust. It changed reproduction, obviously, but it also created all kinds of opportunities for women that weren't there before. It had spread democracy. If it really was the most important event of the 20th century, and maybe he was right, why don't I know how we got there? Yeah, how come none of us know how that all happened and where it came from? Because the devil always hides those things. He always hides those things, so you don't know how this all came about, how this all happened. You don't know that. They said, obviously, that one of the men was fired there. I'm not gonna, I, I've read you some of this already. So I'm going to give you the history here of some dates. 1873. You know, they thwarted all the ethics of law and science these people did. They, I mean, they, they, they gave these pills to women, and women didn't even know what they were doing to them. They had no idea, but they gave them to them anyway. And they were using them as test dummies, basically, like they do today with all the drugs they give people. It's just easier to get away with. But here's some timelines. In 1873, the U.S. Congress passes the Comstock Law, which prohibits the distribution of obscene materials through the U.S. mail or across state lines. It specifically identifies contraceptives as obscene. In 1912, radical feminist Margaret Sanger conceives a, of a magic pill. Contraceptive Sanger later founded the American Birth Control and Planned Parenthood. 1930, on August 15, Lamleth Conference, a periodic meeting of the Anglican's church bishops, approves the use of contraceptives. This was a radical departure from the constant Christian tradition of considering contraception immoral. After 1930, other Protestant denominations began to allow contraception. 1951, Sanger obtains a Planned Parenthood grant for Dr. Pre Gregory Pincus, a biologist, to research hormonal contraceptives, but the funding soon runs out. Earlier, Pincus had shocked the public by his in vitroization in vitro fertilization of rabbits. 1953, Singer convinces Catherine McCormick. Sanger convinces Catherine McCormick. You know, we talked about that. In 1954, Pincus and Dr. John Rock, a Catholic OBGYN who violates church teachings by advocating contraception, begin human trials of the pill. To bypass Massachusetts anti birth control laws, they claim the study is about infertility. 50 female infertility patients volunteer to participate in the study. But the pill is also given to 12 female and 16 male psychiatric, psychiatric patients without their, dissent, without their direct consent. 1955, the pill is proven to prevent ovulation in all 50 women. Pincus presents the findings of the 5th Annual International Planned Parenthood League Conference in Tokyo, Japan. And Rock does the same at the Laurentian Conference of Endro Endocrinology in Canada. The news that a birth control pill has been developed and spreads rapidly among scientists. 1956, large-scale human clinical trials. The pill begins to gain approval by U.S. Food and Drug and the FDA. No, not the FDA. They wouldn't do that, would they? Pincus chooses Puerto Rico as a location. Listen. <laughs> because it provides a large pool of poor, uneducated women who can be easily monitored. The local doctor in charge of the study tells Pincus that the pill causes too many side reactions to be generally acceptable. However, Pincus and Rock dismisses their findings and do not investigate what causes the side effects, nor do they investigate the cause of death for three women who die during the trials. The 
1957, the FDA approves usage of the pill to treat severe menstrual disorders and requires that its packaging include a warning that it will prevent ovulation. Well, that's what they wanted to do. The, the pharmaceutical company GD Searle obtains FDA approval to sell the pill as a contraceptive despite the FDA's initial misgivings about its long-term safety. It becomes the first FDA-approved drug to be given to healthy patients for long-term use and social purposes. As a result of all the publicity, GD Searle Pharmaceutical Company agreed to manufacture the pill and to apply the FDA for approval. But Pincus and Searle come up with yet another sneaky but brilliant idea. They decide we're not going to ask the FDA to approve it as a birth control because that will raise a whole bunch of other issues. Let's just ask them to approve it for menstrual disorders. Almost any woman can go into her doctor and say, I've got an irregular cycle. That was the plan. It worked brilliantly. 1961, Dr. C. Lee Buxton, Yale Medical School of OBGYN, department chairman, executive director of Planned Parenthood, opened four Planned Parenthood clinics in, in Connecticut where the use of birth control is illegal. They are arrested, and the Griswold versus Connecticut case begins to work its way through the court system. In 1962, serious side effects from the pill such as blood clots and heart attacks begin to be publicized. Cyril receives reports of 132 blood clots, 11 of which were terminal, but denies that they are caused by the pill. 1965, the U.S. Supreme Court decides Griswold in Connecticut by overturning the law prohibiting the use of birth control, thereby decriminalizing poison in the form of a pill. Anyway, there's a lot of other dates here. Um, 1972, uh, through its uh, Eisenstadt and Baird decision, the U.S. Supreme Court allows single people to have access to birth control products. In 1988, the FDA convinces drug companies to remove the original high-dose pill from the market. Today, the birth control pill and other birth control products have a lower dosage of estrogen, which increases the chance of breakthrough ovulation, thus increases the likelihood of chemical abortions occurring. See, the pill does cause chemical abortions. I want you to think about that for a second. It's very sobering, isn't it? Because a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Because many Christians, and myself included, the first year that we were married, we used that. I didn't know. I didn't have any clue. I was just saved. I didn't know. I'd never heard of anything like that in my life. Seemed normal to me. Okay, whatever. Didn't know. No preacher told me anything. In fact, the church I was going to, the preacher knew it. He didn't say anything to me about it. Mother and father-in-law knew it. They didn't say anything to me about it. In fact, mother-in-law was my mother-in-law's idea. And she was a pastor's wife. Birth control and other uh, birth control products have a lower... Okay, anyway, so even with the lower dose, the pill still has other dangerous side effects, such as blood clots, breast cancer, stroke, cervical cancer, infertility, weight gain, and much more. Yeah, exactly. By the way, you see the rise of breast cancer in ladies today? Do you want to know that you can go back and trace most of those ladies were on birth control? Let me tell you something, friend. You are not going, you are not going to mock God. You're not going to change God's order. You're not, you're not going to try to get around God's ways of doing things and expect that there will not be consequences for that action. You can't do that, friend. You can't. And listen, I, I'm preaching this because I, I repented of it. I'm done with that. I don't do that. I, I'm done with that. I learned the truth about all that. So I'm not preaching or saying, I've no, oh, I've never been a part of anything like that. No, I carry my own guilt with it. But I'm trying to keep you or anybody out there from involving yourselves in such wickedness. That you would obey God and believe His promise. Which takes us to the next part. What does God say about children? Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. We already covered that. Um, I'll not read those verses to you again. But uh, God said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Now we'll go to Psalms 127, verse number 1. I want you to go there. See what God says. Oh, I know what he says. He says, children are a financial strain and a burden. And if one comes along, man, you're going to starve. You're not going to be able to live as comfortable or have what you want. You can't possibly believe that God's going to take care of you, can you? 
You can't possibly the Lord could take it. I mean, come on, really? I mean, you could you don't really believe that God could take care of your children, do you? I mean, seriously, how could he? I mean, he, he can't handle that. That's such a tall order for God. I mean, what if God gives me ten of them? Well, then you should praise the Lord. Because he gave you ten. Did you know that everybody's quiver is a different size? Somebody's quiver is full at two. Somebody's quiver is full at one. Somebody's quiver is full at five. Somebody's quiver is full at ten. Some has like 18 or 16 or 20. I don't know. But God takes care of all of them. So why don't we believe Him? Why don't we believe God? Why have we, yeah, why have we believed the lie? Why have we fell for the lie? Psalm 127, Psalms 127, verse number 1, Except the Lord build the house. They labor in the vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. No, 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 God, I don't know, wait a minute, wait, no, no, children are expensive. They cost a lot of money. They cramp your style. You can't have all your toys. And you can't have two careers if you're going to raise them right. And you can't do that. And women have to be mothers and take care of their children and love them and see that their only ministry is their husband and their children. No, that's old-fashioned. God, I don't know why you put this in here. They're not a reward. They're a curse, right? They're a curse. You couldn't possibly be taken care of, could you? Where's your faith at? Where's your faith at? So if God blesses you with 10, you're going to say, God, I don't want you to bless me. I, I don't want you. You are telling God, when you use birth control, you're telling God, I don't want the fruit of the womb as a reward. I don't want you to do that. Don't bless me, God. It's vain for you to rise up early. <clears throat> as arrows, see, it says here, low children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Like what Spurgeon said here, he said, hundreds of wealthy persons would give half their estates if they could hear the cry of a babe born of their own bodies. Children are a heritage which Jehovah himself must give, or a man will die childless, and thus his house will be unbuilt. And the fruit of the womb is his reward, or reward from God. He gives children not as a penalty, nor as a burden, but as a favor. They are a token for good. If men know how to receive them and educate them, they are doubtful blessings only because we are doubtful persons. Where society is rightly ordered, children are regarded not as an encumbrance, but as an inheritance. And they are received not with regret, but as a reward. If we are overcrowded in England and so seem to be embarrassed with too large an increase, we must remember that the Lord does not order us to remain in this narrow island, but would have us fill both those boundless regions which wait for the axe and the plow. Yet even here, with all the straits of limited incomes, our best possessions are our own dear offspring for whom we bless God every day. Now, you don't want to have a child when you first get married because that will put too much strain on your, on your marriage. So you want to get... Who says? Doesn't say it in here. Right, exactly. doesn't say it in the Bible. Well, where's that philosophy come from? Margaret Sanger and Satan. I should say Satan via Marga, Margaret Sanger. I'm going to make a whole lot of people happy with this one. 
Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. There is no reason, therefore, why you should be apprehensive for your families and country. There is no reason why you should weary yourself with such great and such restless labor. God will be with you and your children since they are his heritage. Amen. Amen. Children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fault, or excuse me, in the fault, <laughs> and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And he who gave them will feed them. For it is a fact, and the maximum formed on it has never failed. Wherever God sends mouths, he sends meat. Murmur not, said an, Ara an, an Ara Arabian man to his friend, because thy family is large. Know that it is for their sakes that God feeds thee. Could it be that we've bought into that witch Margaret Sanger's philosophy yeah. that children are not a blessing and we don't need them because of money or something else? How big is your God? Anyway, surely not very big that God would wish to bless you and you call it a curse. Well, if we had another child, then it'd be more expensive than this. So, big deal. So it's more expensive. Yeah, bigger inheritance. So sell one of your toys then. Sell one of your toys then. Be industrious. Find ways to make extra money. I got one for you. Be a man! Quit whining! Be a man and take care of things and do what you're supposed to do. Act like God can't provide for you. Buck up, Sally. You know, have you really sacrificed your future children on the altar of ambition or financially getting ahead? or a career, or upward mobility. You don't want to know what happened as soon as they invented that pill. That gave women a reason not to be at home. So they could go out and work. And now we have women that... Now listen, I understand there's ladies that have to take care of themselves. Because there's a lot of worthless men out there. That aren't fathers that make babies and leave women with the uh, leave women to take care of them and, and, and have to uh, work. And I, I'm not picking on you for that. I, I'm not picking on you for that. I Believe me, I preach harder to men. But the real problem is, is that the men don't want to be men and take care of their responsibilities. They don't want to be men. They don't want to take care of their response. They don't want, they don't, they don't want the blessings of God. They want the world. That's what they want. And they want to get ahead. They don't want to be fathers. They don't, want, they, they don't want to be husbands. They want to do what they want to do. They want to run around like a bunch of dogs in heat. That's what they want to do. You say, well, you got to feed them. I know. God hasn't let you starve yet. That's right. Psalms 37, verse number 25. I don't want to ruin your theology here, but it says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Well, then that would mean that God's going to take care of me, and that would blow out my theory that I don't... That I should withhold, I, I should use birth control so we don't have any ch too many children because God can't possibly take care of us. Listen, do you understand? Well, we're going to get to that in a second here. I got to keep moving. Believe me, I'm almost done. This is going long, but it, it needs to be said, so I'm going to keep saying it. The fruit of the womb is his reward. John Howard Hinton's daughter said to him as she knelt by his deathbed, she said this about her father. She said, There's no greater blessing than for children to have godly parents. And his father and her father said, dying with a beam of gratitude for parents to have godly children. As arrows, well doth David call children arrows, for if they be well bred, they shoot at their parents' enemies. And if they be evil bred, they shoot at their parents. Henry Smith, 1560 to 1591. <laughs> Amen, that's right. If children are a blessing, then why are we playing God and trying to keep ourselves from a blessing? Why? Why have we fell, fell for the whole trick of eugenics? Why have we fell for Margaret Sanger's theology? Why have we fell for her communism? Why have we fell for her witchcraft? Who hath bewitched you? 
Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, did God punish those in Scripture for preventing life? Well, look at Exodus chapter 21, verse number 22. It's a long sermon. Boy, you're getting your money's worth today, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm glad I don't charge overtime. <laughs> Double time on Sunday, Brother Paul. <laughs> Some hazard pay if you keep looking at me like that, I'm telling you. <laughs> right, Brother Paul? <laughs> uh, Exodus chapter 21, verse number 22, 23. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall, play, he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Yeah, because that's a baby in there. God doesn't like preventing life. He doesn't like taking life. How about Genesis chapter 20, verse number 18? Who controls the womb? Who has power over the womb? Is it you? Are you supposed to have power over the womb? Who do you think you are? What's my life? I can do what I want. Whoa, wait a minute now. Wait, 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 wait. I thought the Bible said you're not your own for you're bought and paid for with the price. You belong to Christ. No, it's not your own. Now, if you're not a Christian, then you're right. You're going to go to hell, and your body's your own. Amen. But don't claim Christ and say your body's yours. Amen. Look at this, Genesis 20, verse number 18. And the Lord, for the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Wait a minute. Whoa. You mean God... Yeah, he closed up their wombs and none of them are having babies. Why? You give me back my prophet's wife. You don't give back my prophet's wife, you're all going to die. And you're never going to have a baby again. Because why? Because the promised seed's coming through there. He controls it, right? Genesis 29, 31, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Wait, who opened her womb? God. God opened her womb. 1 Samuel 1, 5 and 6, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. 1 Samuel 1, 5 and 6. Who shut the womb? The Lord shut the womb. Did it say that, did it say that, that, uh, that she did? Or that she tried to? Or that she prevented it? No. It says the Lord shut it. Now, Genesis chapter 38, verse number 8. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Why? Because his sole purpose was to prevent life. It wasn't that he didn't just didn't want to marry her. He was fine to marry her. He was fine to sleep with her. What didn't he want? Children. So what did he do? Just what the Bible says he did. That's what he did. Onan tried to play God, and for that, God took him out. Onan's judgment was not due to the simple refusal to raise up offspring for the widow. If he wanted to refuse that duty, he could have followed the teaching of Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 10. He had an out. Remember? Remember um, with uh, Ruth? Remember remember the man had to take his right shoe off, right? He took his shoe off and he could say, I don't want to be the kinsman redeemer. And he, could, and he didn't have to do it. He'd be one as with his shoe off. <laughs> I remember that. You remember that, Nate? Is one is with the shoe off. <laughs> He's the man with one shoe. Anyway, but that's what they said. <laughs> but he practiced birth control. That's what he did. That was, that, that was what he was doing. Deuteronomy 25 and 6, And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Genesis 3, 16, Under the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Ruth 4.13, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. In Hosea chapter 9, verse number 11, As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. What is conception? Life. So what are you withholding when you try to hold that? Life. Purposely withholding life. With over 17 million American women using the pill and other chemical abortifacients, abort it is estimated that breakthrough ovulation pregnancy occurs so often that between 7 to 12 million newly conceived children are killed by chemical abortions in the womb each year. And most of these women never even knew they were pregnant. Infant homicides through contraceptives, 1994, by the study of abortion deaths and hot commission. I don't think there should be a real argument among Christians when life begins, but who controls life, God or you? Right. Listen to what Luther said about this. And again, I'm not Luther, and I understand my differences with him, but as far as what he said, he's correct. How great, therefore, the wickedness of fallen human nature is. How many girls there are who prevent conception and kill and expel tender fetuses, although procreation is the work of God. Indeed, some spouses who marry and live together have various ends in mind, but rarely children. That was his time. Luther called his old enemy, he called it, that clever harlot, natural reason. He said that, you ever heard of that? He said this natural reason comes in, that old harlot. Right? So we reason things out. Had come back in new guise at the second millennium's end. By natural reason, he meant the wisdom of the world, unformed and unregulated by divine witness in Holy Scripture. As he quoted this beast back in 1522, he said this, Alas, must I rock the baby, wash its diapers, make its bed, smell its stench, Stay up nights with it, take care of it when it cries, heal its rashes and sores, and on top of that, care for my wife, provide for her, labor at my trade, take care of this and take care of that, endure this and endure that. What? Should I make such a prisoner of myself? Yeah, exactly, all that and more. Such a prisoner of myself? Luther said this, he said, the purpose of marriage is not to have pleasure and to be idle, but to procreate and bring up children, to support a household. Those who have no love for children are swine, stocks, and logs, unworthy of being called men or women, for they despise the blessings of God, the creator and author of marriage. This quote was found in a sermon that I had seen on Sermon Audio, which I thought was just really good. He said, he said this, he said, we have not found... We have found not one orthodox theologian to defend birth control before the 1900s. Not one. On the other hand, we have found that many highly regarded Protestant theologians were enthusiastically opposed to it. All the way back to the very beginning of the Reformation, those in favor of birth control will find no one in the orthodox Protestant camp for the first four centuries to ally themselves with. In the Westminster Confession, they say this, and by doing this to hinder the beginning of a living child, it is the first degree murder that can be committed. And the next unto it is the marriage of conception when it is made and causing of abortion. Now such acts are noted in the scripture as horrible crimes because otherwise many might commit them and not know the evil of them. It is conceived that his brother Ur before, and he's talking about the sin of Onan here, okay? His brother was in evil thus far that both of them satisfied their sensuality against the order of nature and therefore the Lord cut therefore the Lord cut them off both alike with sudden vengeance which may be for terror to those popish onanites that's a new one for you Nate the popish onanites the popish onanites who condemned marriage and live in a Sodom sodomite impurity and to those who in marriage care not for the increase of children which is the principal use of the conjugal estate, but for the satisfying of their concupiscence. So these Puritan reformed, they said this, what are the sins forbidden in the sixth commandment? They believe that using birth control is breaking the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. 
That's what they believe it's doing. What are the sins forbidden? Answer, the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment are all taking away the life of ourselves or of others, except in case of public, in, public justice, lawful war, or necessary defense. The neglecting or withdrawing the lawful and necessary means of preservation of life, sinful anger, hatred, envy, desire of revenge, all excessive passions, distracting cares, immoderate use of meat, drink, labor, and recreations, provoking words, oppressions, quarreling, striking, and wounding, and whatsoever else tend to the destruction of the life of any. In the minutes of the general meeting of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, they said this, which met in 1888. They said, we believe that uncleanness in all its polluting and debasing forms is increasing. We fear that many who are members of the churches of the church employ means to prevent offspring using the marriage bed to gratify their lust, destroying their own lives, and bringing on themselves the wrath of a holy God. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were a little bit compromising, weren't they? Just a bit. The only reason why I quoted them, though, is for an historical reference, because most Baptists were losing their heads, so they didn't write on it very much. But um, uh, they're being killed by most Reformers. But anyway, that's another story um, for another day. Uh, but the point is, is that these people, they believe that it was breaking the Sixth Commandment. Okay? They believe that, that withholding life, why? Because you had it in the power of you not to withhold that life, and you doing that is unlawfully hindering life to keep from having a baby. Then you are knowingly breaking the Sixth Commandment. Because how many future children will not come because you withhold that? Because you practice birth control? There isn't one Bible verse you could show me that could that 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 you could do. No, there are times that people that that husband and wife and wives withhold themselves, okay, from the marriage bed for different reasons. The Bible talks about that for for certain modesty reasons, cleanliness reasons, for war and other things like that that took place, and and safety and some other things like that. There's some things that that um, you know for disease and things like that in different times of the month and things like that. But those were all allowed for in God's law. God already talked about those things. He already explained. He already taught on all those things. But see, the reason why the Israelites would always repopulate a land and fill it, and they would be conquerors, is because they never used birth control. It was wrong. It was a sin. God said, "Be fruitful and multiply." So where does it come from? It comes from Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, and directly from the devil. It's not from God. So who do you believe? You believe Margaret Sanger? Do you believe apostate Christianity today, or do you believe God? I guess you have to ask yourself that question. Do I trust in the living God? Do I believe Him? Do I believe that He'll meet all my needs? Do I really believe children are a blessing of the Lord? Are heritage of the Lord, and they're a blessing? Do I really believe that? Are they a reward from God? Or do I follow modern philosophy of the day? It's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. You know what? If you have followed the modern philosophy of the day, you can repent. You can get right with God. You can ask God to forgive you. You can do that. You can be forgiven. And you can move forward and do right. You can't change the past and what you've done, but you can move forward and do right. There's not a bit of teaching you could find anywhere that... that uh, that promotes birth control. I've heard Piper and those other uh, sellouts out there now, and Piper's running around. John Piper, the guy that used to be in Minneapolis, at the Baptist Church in Minneapolis, he's saying, well, there's nothing in the Bible that's against birth control. What do you mean there's nothing in the Bible against birth control? I think you need to quit reading C.S. Lewis and read the Bible. That's what I think you need to do. Yeah, he's reading a different one. That's right. But you know what? You better, you better go to the Bible for your theology and not, not man's opinion, and certainly not Margaret Sanger. Unless, of course, you think that Mark, God led Margaret Sanger to produce the uh, birth control pill and contraceptives in general, which, by the way, were illegal in America. You couldn't even have them. Father, Lord, I pray that you'd wake your people up to this truth. I pray, dear God, that we would follow it. And I pray, dear God, that those that need to repent would repent, get it right with you. And, Lord... Uh, Thank you for all the children you've blessed them with and you want to bless us with. Thank you, Lord, for my children. 
Thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you chose. Thank you for showing me this truth a while ago, Lord. Thank you for bringing me to repentance about that issue and learning the truth about it, Lord. Help us to follow the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back here.